you, you all, I'm sure, observed uh, our presenter running out of the room. This is not to be construed as stage fright of any sort. Uh, however, at those certain moments of our lives, it was a, a necessity to disappear for a moment or two, and I'm assured that Peter will return. Of course, if he doesn't return, I have the slides, and I, I have all of his notes. Um, and knowing Peter, I could probably just read his notes and we'd all be happy. Uh, my name is Sheldon Smith. I'm the education director for the club. Um, Christine is handing out, thank you. <laughs> Christine is handing out um, flyers or a little program booklet that Peter developed uh, for resources. And uh, we made 50 of them. So when we run out, you can harass Peter afterwards and, and he can send out copies. She's also handing out uh, Come Listen, Educate, Win, our little coupon. And uh, when Attila the Hun, which is me, figured out how to do this thing, we were going to make sure everybody stayed the entire time. And if you didn't get here on time, we were not going to give you a coupon. If you left early, we weren't going to hole punch it. And then yesterday, everybody kind of like, I pretty much were mesmerized by the two seminars yesterday. And pretty much everybody came early and stayed till the bitter end. So just take the coupon over to the showroom floor. There's a little roly, what do you call those tumbler thingamajiggers? Uh, and we'll have the drawing tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, fourth prize is a $1 uncirculated South Point. Third prize is a $5 uncirculated South Point. Second prize is a $25 uncirculated South Point. And first prize is a $100 uncirculated South Point. So whether you collect South Point chips or not, it's not too bad to uh, have an opportunity to win a hundred dollar South Point chip which you can immediately turn around walk out of the showroom go down to the cashier and cash in for a hundred dollars if you want to um, in any case uh, Peter's back um, the seminar today promises to be uh, interesting um, and so make sure that you fill out the little spot on it where you print your name and sign it and then just drop it off uh, this afternoon's uh, seminar uh, also promises to be interesting um, Richard Greeno is going to be doing a seminar on the first 13 uh, strip casinos. And uh, I've discussed this with one or two people and with uh, Richard. Uh, the little quiz at the end of that is, what was the 14th casino's name? What year was it built? And where was it? And I didn't know the answer, but that's because I'm not good at that sort of thing. Uh, I urge you to turn off your cell phones if you possibly can. Uh, mine's off. Um, yesterday we were pretty good at that and the last thing is before I introduce Peter um, is to we're gonna hold questions till the end of the presentation my experience has been that you get into conversations and suddenly the presentation disappears um, so uh, Peter has been involved in uh, this aspect of the hobby for quite some time he is reputed to be an expert um, I got that from a very close source to Peter Peter himself uh, so we're reasonably certain that this ought to be pretty good. I'm going to turn it over to Peter Nathan. Peter, it's all yours. By the way, if you have any say in who runs the education seminars for the next 30 years in this club, don't let him go. Do you want your book, Shelf? All right, did everybody get a list of reference materials? Okay, we're going to take two minutes out of the question and answer at the end, and I'm going to go over and make the corrections that I made in the last 24 hours. So. <coughs> Now, the, the title of the topic is Multiple Facets of Valuation of a Chip. Um, a lot of the topic deals with identifying the chip. And so we're going to cover both valuation and identification sort of as a combined topic. I have been asked to remind all of you, buyers, sellers, and authors, that that list of guides, the various books that are out being sold around the room, are exactly that. 
they are guides and they some of them have prices or price values etc keep in mind that they're guides there is nothing absolute about any price in any book and if you go to 10 people all experts on the same chip you're going to get 10 different values <laughs> Okay, now the three key facets of valuation are one, supply, two, demand, and three, condition. Now we're gonna talk mostly today about the demand. The supply is the rarity issue. And I can't stress strongly enough that if you want to learn what the author is thinking when he creates his book, read the stuff at the beginning. The how-to, the introductions, why they wrote the damn book, whatever it is. Uh, I was talking to one of the authors who said, I did the introduction for a major book here and he said, I spent more time on the introduction, the how-to, the codes, everything, the molds, everything, than I did on the book itself. And that's important because if you, especially if any of you are beginners or are learning and wa want to learn more about it, you know, the study of molds from Eisenstadt or uh, Howie and uh, just the whole group of items that make up a chip you want to know before you what that author thinks before you open his book and look at what he's going to price this chip that you're looking at um, also in the rarity issue always remember that it's rare today and you got to keep in the back of your mind is a box of them going to float up from the ocean and show up in someone's kitchen or has it always been in the kitchen etc and lo and behold they're going to dump them on the market after you buy this very expensive chip so there are some that the more you know about the chip the manufacturer and how its rarity was created, the more you'll understand whether it's likely that a box of these chips is going to show up. And um, as we go along, uh, if, it, if it pops up and it will near the end of the seminar, we'll talk about that. Now, so the key for today's lecture, and if you have a pen, and you have my little list, turn it over, because there are really seven items of why a buyer wants to buy a chip. So if you're a seller, you want to think about the buyer's reasons. If you're a buyer, you want to think about your own reasons, because those reasons make up the demand. And the demand is only for this particular chip that you're looking at, either at my table or, or uh, you're planning to sell this chip and you'd like to know how to price it. The, the um, buyer's seven reasons, and they may only have one, all right? But I want to cover, I want to go just list the seven reasons. Um, he might be a, one, a denomination collector, okay? I deal in $2.50 chips. All the slides you're going to see, or most of them, are going to be $2.50 chips. Because I've been working on a book with Chuck and three other people, and um, I've learned a lot, but a lot of these points have come up in the last, what have we been working, four years? <laughs> I don't even have, I only have one chapter done. But, uh, so, denomination. Second thing is location. All right, now I happen to collect 250s worldwide. All right, I know some people who collect 
in this room who collect 250s in the United States. But the, the one key point of location was raised by one of the authors in the first edition of his book when he mentioned, and, I be, and, and I, it's come to be true, if all of the facets relating to two chips are identical, and one of the chips is from Nevada, and one of the chips is from Mississippi. The rarity, everything is equal, okay? The chip from Nevada is going to be more valuable. So that location, because there are more Nevada collectors, and um, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. That doesn't mean you want to become a Nevada collector because they're more valuable. Um, it's just you have your own reason for being a collector, but this is an important one that the, um, the dealer is going to use to price the chip, and um, a lot of the dealers believe is true. <coughs> Number three is the casino. Some people collect hard rocks, playboys. That's fine. And if the casino is a real popular casino, then those chips, the demand will be greater, the rarity won't change, and therefore the chip will be more valuable. Fourth is the mold. There are mold collectors. All right? You've all heard of my mistake 10, 12 years ago when I said, oh, this is an Arodi mold. And someone says, you got to learn how to pronounce them as well as spell them. Okay, and arrow dye is probably the most, certainly the most famous mold. And um, there are people who will pay more because the chip is an arrow dye or because it's a small key or a large key. I mean, whatever the reasons, that's one of the reasons. Number five is the inlay or the graphic, okay? Um, now we're getting almost into what stamp collectors did years ago, which is topical stamp collecting. I used to be a stamp collector and dealer, and there were people who would collect anything on a stamp. I mean flowers, trains, some people had specific flowers. Whatever it is, it was important um, to them. And, um, you know, there are people here who collect roses on chips. Uh, there's a new one collecting um, trains, I heard was on the chip board. He's looking for trains. And someone came up to my table and said, oh, you got to send, you know, the Colorado station from Colorado has a train on the front. So, and that's, that's a real specialty in chips because you know, but you could also be looking at hot, some people collect gold hot stamps. Some people collect silver hot stamps. I mean, whatever the reason, that's fine, but that's an important part of the valuation. Now, the sixth and seventh issues are the ones we're going to talk about today. Six is the first issue or the first series. People like to have the first series of chips from any casino. You know, people go around and collect grand openings. Now, the grand openings could be limited editions, and that's really a whole nother ball game in valuation because sometimes they're, they just flood the market. But the first series of a casino, especially a casino that was in existence for a year, Two years, you know, in Mississippi there was Splash and there was uh, Southern Bell and um, you just Gold Shore. These chips have become valuable because they're they're rare, but they're rare because the casino wasn't open very long. Now, um, so people collect that. And finally, the last thing is something I picked up also from an author, and that's aesthetic appeal. How pretty is the chip? And I mean yesterday we were talking about 
the Lady Luck from Tunica in Mississippi, which to me is one of the most beautiful chips ever made. Okay, that appeal alone, we uh, as a dealer selling 250 Lady Luck, it goes for more from my table because I think it's gorgeous. So now, okay. Uh, sorry, but my cards got out of order. Okay, um, as far as condition, which was the third key facet, if we have some time today, remember the first facet was supply, second demand, third condition. I don't know if we're going to have time because I have a very limited amount of time to keep my mouth open. Right, Sheldon? All right. So we may get to condition or we may do it next year. Okay. All right. Now, topic one for this seminar is the issuance or the man the manufacturer's deliverance of a series of chips to a casino, and then his subsequent order, the casino manager's subsequent order of chips. And if they order the identical chip, all right, to me, I'm sorry, it defeats the whole purpose of collecting. But we've, I actually didn't develop this. I, I want to thank a lot of people, especially Greg and even Joe. Where's Joe in the back? Is he here? Yeah. Joe came to my table maybe... Oh, it's got to be six, eight years ago. He doesn't even remember, but I've never forgotten. He came to my table with a plaque of chips he had put on and said, these have unique UV pictures. And that got me started. I told him someday we would use it to identify and value chips. All right, now let's look at this first slide. All right. This first slide... At the top is two, and I mean identical, Horseshoe Tunica 250. It's a pretty chip, fluorescent pink, actually showed up pretty good in the camera work, I got lucky, all right? You can't tell the difference. This, this isn't a question of a variation. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, this is a question, these two chips are the same until you put them under a black light. And now they're very different. The chip on the left actually shows not only a, a different UV mark, and by the way, for those of you who haven't been involved with Paulson Hat and Cane chips, okay, that's where you use this the most, is on clay chips manufactured by Paulson, although other manufacturers are now, when they use a paper inlay, are putting in these security marks. All right, now this is the Hatton cane. We'll talk about the position in a minute. But the one on the left is not only a different position, but even the clay, composite clay and color, are substantially different. These two chips were not manufactured at the same time. Now, I cannot tell you, because Paulson just refuses to make any information available. And by the way, Paulson is now a member of the GPI gaming group, and, uh, um, but still putting out chips under the Paulson name. And so the one on the left has uh, a different hat and cane position than the one on the right, and the color of the clay is different. They were issued substantially years apart. The problem in this particular one, and in most of them, is we don't know which was first, and we don't know how far apart they are. If, we may, if Paulson won't give it, you can always go try to get the horseshoe in tunica 
the chip guy to tell you when he ordered them. All right, now they combined them. So you go into, you go into the, 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 excuse me. You go into the casino and both of these are on the table. All right, now the key, oh yeah, I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned, yeah. Let's just go back and turn your paper over. One of the other um, things is, well, I guess the issuance versus the age. Put age in there because the age of the chip does have an effect on value. And uh, I'm sorry to say I don't know which of these chips is older. Um, all right, let's go on to... Um, using this same topic for a minute, go to the second slide, Sheldon, please. Very good, very good. Okay. Now, I want to thank Chuck for the, Chuck actually sent me this, these scans and the next scans. All right. Now, this is a cruise ship, and it's the MS Ooster Dam. Part of the Holland American line, right? I think. And these chips are different to the naked eye. The one on the left, the obverse and reverse, is darker than the one on the right. Enough so that when I first started doing the chapter on cruise ships for the 250s, we called them, and Chuck sent them to me as. Oosterdam dark and Oosterdam light. Now, up until I started pushing this topic about a year ago, um, this was a variation to collectors. We have a lot of 250 collectors who don't give a damn whether they have the dark or the light. All right? Because as far as they're concerned, these are just variations at the time of manufacture. And there was only one issue of this chip. Now let's go to the next slide, Sheldon, please. Okay. Now, they were not manufactured at the same time, and they are not a variation. The dark chip has no UV mark on it. The light chip has a UV mark in the center of the hat and cane, on both the tie, it doesn't show well on the uh, obverse, but it shows real well on the reverse. All right, they were not manufactured at the same time, and therefore it is a different chip. Now, keeping that in mind, let's talk about how we identify this. Sheldon, how about the next slide, please? Okay. Now, those of you who do use the chip guide for non-Nevada chips, all right, have seen all of these. These, most of these, well, some are from me and some are from Greg, okay? And Greg has always supported the idea of the UV because um, I don't know how he got into it. I've never discussed it with him, but he does show these differences. He doesn't explain why they're different or what the, what the purpose is, but I believe the purpose is that they are manufactured at different times. So now when, he, when you go on his guide, and if you use, you know, I, I don't want to get into a fight over numbering and which, whose numbers you should use and which books you should use, I do every chip by country, state, casino, city, if it's Nevada. And, uh, and then I describe the chip. And when I put a UV showing the chip, I do it by the position of the hat and cane. Okay? So going clockwise from the upper left, the, the, the hat and cane that's horizontal is position one. And so 
if I can get Greg to change his type 1 and type 2 to position 1, position 2, and if you come to my table, when I mark something UV, it'll say position 1, 2, 3, or 4. Goes clockwise, as far as I'm concerned. No questions until the end, because Sheldon gets very upset. All right, and he's our leader. <laughs> okay. Um, position one is upper left. Position two is where the cane, Haddon cane, has been rotated clockwise, 90 degrees. Position three, which is lower right, it's been rotated another 90 degrees, so it's upside down. And position in four, obviously, is the fourth one going back up the clock towards number one. Okay. Now, um, Sheldon, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, the size of the mark is also an indication that it's a different issue. Um, in this particular one, this is, I don't remember, this is one of our, oh, this is the fun ship Peach, okay? For cruise ships from Carnival Lines are called fun ship. The, the chip says the fun ships on it and it comes in seven background colors, peach, brown, purple, some are much more valuable than others, but the peach is the cheapest because they're all over the place. The reason they're all over the place is they've been issued four times. All right. Now, I'm only showing you these two because the Hatton cane is in position one in the upper one, but it's much smaller than the Hatton cane. I don't know I'm going to step up there just for a second. This is the cane. This is the hat. Very large. It the magnification is exactly the same. So it's the, what we call the standard size hat and cane. And I call the other one small, tiny, whatever. And um, there now Greg has tried to create types when the same size hat and cane is in different positions of the inlay. I have to tell you, I haven't quite agreed with that yet. I don't know exactly why it would be off center. They're supposed to put them in the center, and Paulson usually puts them in the center, but not always. And Greg has used a type 1 and type 2 where the, um, the hat and cane in type 1 is in the center, and it, let's say it's position 1, and the hat and cane in type 2 is lower left. Same size, different, different area of the inlay. Uh, I haven't, I not yet convinced myself that that is anything more than a variation. I don't know. All right? But definitely, when the Hatton cane is rotated, or it's a different size, and, you, you know, take 10 chips, they're all going to be exactly the same, then that is an issue of that same chip. Okay. Uh, what's the next slide? Sheldon. Okay, this is a separate topic. So let's, we'll leave that up there because this is the second topic. Um, but let's, well, all right, we'll do the second topic and then we'll talk about how do you use this in valuation. All right, now this is a topic that in 10 years I've gotten Ten different stories about Chipko's re fading. Okay, I mean, when I first started, I'm a big Caribbean traveler. I own a couple of timeshares down in St. Martin, and I used to go there all the time. And I'd switch it to Aruba because Aruba had more casinos and easier ones to play in. 
And then um, I've been to Curacao and Bonaire and um, the Bahamas, of course, when I lived in South Florida. Um, and, you know, I just put it in as he does. Now, this is, these two pictures actually come off of Greg's site. They're the better, the, the more aesthetic one is on the right and is actually above the, oh, I'm sorry, is actually above the picture of what he calls the light pink variety, <laughs> okay? And by the way, this picture, when you do a scan of it, this is better looking than the chip itself, all right? Now, let me give you the history of the of Chipko's problem so you will understand that these are clearly two different chips and we can determine when the faded one was issued. Chipko made chips, I don't know when they first started, but they, had a, they used General Electric for their resins in the early 90s. And for some reason, unknown, not even listed in the lawsuit, uh, for some reason, they went to, I mean, it was an obvious reason, all right? They got cheaper resin from a company called Allen, Allen Industries. And Allen Industries, they started buying the resins from Allen Industries in about 94. And by the end of 95, according to the uh, litigation, by the end of 95, all of their chips were made with Allen resin. And from, from late 95 until early 96, they sent out chips to whoever was buying chips from Chipco. And it didn't take long. I mean, this is not an aware problem. This is not uh, anything other than the fact the resin was bad. Now, the reason I finally found out the whole true story is because some of them don't fade as much as others. And that has to do really with the colors on the chip. The reds and pinks fade much more than the blacks and blues, all right? So that if you have a Chipko chip manufactured with Allen resin, it will be faded a little bit. But it will also feel like it's linen. So I've seen situations where they have these two chips, identical chips except for the, the fading, and they call that the linen variety and this the satin variety, okay? Even though it's tough to have a satin variety in a chip go chip. But it's much smoother because in the fading, the roughness came out because some of the resin would disappear. So now, he puts down dark pink variety and light pink variety. And as far as anybody's concerned, they're the same chip, and they go out and they don't buy the light pink, all right? As far as they're concerned, why not have a pretty chip if it's the same issue? But it isn't. In 96, early 96 and late 95, Chipko realized they had a real problem. And a lot of the casinos were complaining bitterly. So Chipko offered to have you return your entire series of chips back to them, and they will make you a new one with better resin. Okay? And in, and in some instance, but in most instances, they made exactly the same chip. Sometimes the colors are a little different, because they're using a different resin, but they use the same design, the same chip. Now, you notice I said they sent the casino sent back. They didn't, you don't keep these because 
you get new ones for free. It cost Chipgo just under a million dollars to correct those that were sent back. Okay? So, guess what? The chip on the left is very rare. If you took it out and put it in your pocket and put it in your collection early on, it might have had a little less fading, or you were there and that was the only chip they had. And you're a 250 collector, and man, you want this 250 chip from this casino. Okay? Now, as it happens, it's a pretty chip. And it's the only, and of course, Harris in Tunica doesn't exist in that Harris. It was Harris Tunica, then it was Harris Mardi Gras Tunica, and now Harris is back in in a different location. In this, with Harris' name because of their combination of owning Horseshoe and everything, they had to go back in and um, their, their, their new chip, the Harris Tunica chip that was manufactured after they closed the Mardi Gras is a completely different 250. So it just came out, I guess, within the last year and uh, it's a pretty plain chip. It's, you know, you can get them uncirculated, I think, still. Um, so, but we're only talking about these two chips. And the one on the left, you know, especially if you happen to find it less faded, but you won't in most cases, may be very rare. There may be 100. There may be 10. No one knows. I mean, obviously, a few people have them. Greg put it up and I believe owns the chip. Um, so now we know the age and the fact that it's a different issue. All right, now disregarding the aesthetic appeal, which is one of the facets in the demand, okay, the chip on the left, let's say, is one-tenth the rarity of the chip on the right. It could make it pretty valuable. Eventually there are some that are valuable. Now I haven't been able to sell them because nobody wants that ugly chip. Okay? But that's really a way of not only identifying the fact that it's a separate issue, but identifying when the first one was made. Okay, and you could probably figure out when Greg put it up on his list, how many years later, um, you know, it's probably 19, he might even have a date, he might have 1997. Okay, so they're almost the same age, but the one on the left is more valuable from a standpoint of rarity. Okay, now. Uh, let me just throw out, how we doing? We're okay? We're not okay. Okay. We're not okay. Um, let's, I, why didn't you stand up and shoot me? That's what you're supposed to do. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, let me just throw out this one thing and then we'll run question and answers for as long as you people want. I don't care. That'll, that'll piss him off, but that's what I guess. <laughs> okay. And you don't edit that out, Candy. <laughs> All right? So take the one thing where we know an identical chip was issued three and a half years apart. And I mean identical, I'm sorry to say. And that's our good friend Steve Wynn. Okay? I don't know how many of you were there on the opening night of Encore. I know Sheldon and, and Chris were there. I was there. I mean, I walked in, I got my rack of 100, I looked at it, and I went home. I cried, practically. I said, what an idiot he is. But that, you know, as Trimble says, hey, it doesn't matter to Steve about the collectors, and it doesn't matter about the money. He just wanted to get it up. And it's the same corporation. He might have saved a buck or two. All right? Now... 
So in April of 2005, he issued the wind chip, and he issued the identical wind chip in December of 2008. And I mean they're identical. I thought they were different. I looked at them from UV. I went on the chipboard, and of course, Sprague was all over me the next morning. You are wrong. They're the same. And they really are. I actually have a rack of 100 of the win uncirculated and a, ha a rack of the 100 Encore's win uncirculated. And there actually is a slight difference. It's clearly a variation of the paper color. It's a little darker in the new ones than it was back three and a half years ago. So here we have the perfect situation of knowing two different issues, and he got the same chip. Okay, can I start asking for questions? Thank you. Okay, now you had your hand up way early. Okay. Oh, there are all kinds of. You, what do you mean by different? Um, not that I know of, because I will tell you this, I can take an entire issue that I know is one issue, and you will get 100% of whatever the mark is. So there is no doubt in my mind that if the Haddon Kane is in a, a you, I consider these all about the same size. Like, you know, some people don't. But th if this is their standard size for that particular issue, the position is, does show a difference only when, you get, only when you get a new setup. So yes, I, I, I'm an absolute believer that if those four appeared on one chip, on uh, the same chip, you got four issues of that chip. Yeah. Well, they supposedly were for security reasons, okay? Um, Paulson's been doing it a long time. Um, how long? I don't know when they started. I'm, I'm relatively new to this collection and dealing business of chips. I've been gambling since 1963, but I haven't been, and I've been, I didn't start collecting chips until 95 or 96. Uh, actually, on a trip to the Caribbean, I decided, because I was in the Royal Cabana, and I had a slightly faded chip, which the texture is very high. And then when they remade the chip, it's absolutely smooth. So, yeah, all right, I got a rough and a smooth. So now I got two different chips. And I put them in, and because they were 250s, and I had started, I had learned very early on that you can't collect everything. So I limited my collection to 250s. But um, so these, their marks on those, on those chips, those are chip code chips, so they don't have any marks. But there were chips from the Caribbean that I probably picked up in the 90s. And uh, you guys who are into, uh, manufacturer Paulson's been in business a very long time. Now there are a lot of there are early chips that don't have a UV mark, and it was really for security purposes. And now, practically every chip is going to have a UV mark, and I still believe you'll be able to tell the different issues. Chris. Yeah. Well, you know, not four, but you, but once, let's assume it's a Paulson chip, and you pick the casino, I don't know, Luxor, I guess, has been some changes. Um, 
And so, yes, you have a $1 chip, and you put your UV light. Now, the next time you go into that casino, you notice that they're, geez, these are really clean chips, okay? And you say to the guy, when did you get new chips? And he says, yesterday. And now you, now you take that home and you put the UV light on, you're going to have, I, I guarantee it, a different issue of the same chip. Yes, you're going to collect those two chips. Now, let me add one thing. I know he gets upset. Um, the, my use of this, and the reason I started this, is I believe uncirculated clay chips are valuable. It's my baby, okay? Uh, even uncirculated ones. I deal in uncirculated ones and all 250s. But... I also believe that in in win situation, if they were different, okay, my uncirculated win that's three and a half years old has got to be worth more than the uncirculated one that everybody just picked up at the at the cage. Because either they get passed around or they get used, you know. I mean, I'm I'm very specific. If, if, if I don't get it at a cage or I don't get it from someone who I absolutely trust, tells me it's uncirculated, then I don't call it uncirculated. I'll call it mint. And we're not going to get into condition today because we don't have enough time. So, um, but yes, to answer your specific question, yeah, and if you happen to have gotten the first one uncirculated, or even, in, let's say the first one is SU, okay? And now, 10 years later, the chips which were just moldy and dirty, <laughs> my men missed, how do you pronounce your last name, Pat? Fricky? Fricky. Mr. Fricky yesterday told me he cleaned a chip and scraped off the hot stamp. And excuse me, but you don't clean chips. If you, for your own collection, you can do anything you want to. If you plan to sell a chip, a clean chip is not as valuable as an unclean chip. It may look better, and you may get 50 cents more from that standpoint, but when it gets to be in an R5, R6, R7, R8, okay, the chip better not have been changed as far as I'm concerned. So your SU, which may be 10 years old, as far as I'm concerned, if the rarity of that series, that issue, is down to an R5, or up to an R5, if you go the other way, and this one is an R1, your SU should be more valuable than an uncirculated R1. And that's really why I brought this in, because it really covers valuation. All right, someone, Sam, you had your hand. Sure. Um, Sheldon? <laughs> Here, wait a second. Um, you want to go back to number one? Yeah. Oh, oh, you... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, go to... Se all the way down to... No, yeah, that one. Okay. Right. Uh, well, that's real. Yeah, right. Well, supply, the rarity is really the supply. Demand okay. is. Okay. okay. Right. Now, you said the rarity or the supply of the faded one is much less. Oh, absolutely. Than the one on the right. At least 10 to 1. The demand isn't there. Right. Okay. So Until you point out to them that it's a rarer chip and they understand that it's not a damaged chip. It's an issue of a chip by chip go and they screwed up. Now there are a lot of people, you're right, a lot of people, I couldn't sell that 250 on the left for anywhere near what I can sell the 250 uncirculated for on the right. That was my question. Yes. It, right now, right now, it might take, yeah, but I might have it priced higher. I probably do. It's just no one's buying it. Okay? 
And it's more rare, but there's no demand. That's exact. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. No, no, because you won't get the same fading. You bleach it, you'll lose the blue, okay? And you'll notice the blue isn't really a... F the blue... This one is a, an exceptional thing. I don't know why it is so faded, but there are a lot of Chipco chips that are not as faded, okay? And by the way, I'm not... In, I can't guarantee you that someone can't rub off a UV mark. I'm not interested in how they counterfeit them. I'm only interested in the honest people. And I don't want you taking this good one and trying to make it look like that. Okay? No, I don't believe you can do that. And Well, because I think what will happen is the colors of the blue and the Harris and the blue, especially the dark behind the Harris, will fade and then you'll know that it was tampered with. That's all. Uh, I, I, I do want to point out an interesting story. They actually got me into this whole thing of the faded chips. I assume most of you know about the Club Royale uh, day cruise ship out of Florida. If you don't, you ought to learn about it because the Club Royale chips, one through 500, I think, or one, six chips. Club Royale chips, not the faded variety, the original variety. They happen to have reversed themselves, but for a very different reason. The Club Royale boat opened in April of, I guess it was 96, sailed for a month or two, and sunk with all of its chips, okay? The 250 Club Royale, which I have on my table, is worth probably $600, okay? 550, 600, and don't come in and ask me to sell it for 450, because I probably won't, all right? Um, now, after the ship sunk, this poor, <laughs> this poor company went out and got a second ship and ordered chips from Chipto during the Allen Resin. So, and they sailed for about a month. And instead of sending the chips back because they didn't intend, they were going broke, they just gave them out in boxes. So in that particular and they're not the same because the ones that went down are plastic. Uh, I'm pretty sure were um, what is called uh, RTP, RT Plastics Company. Uh, makes plastic chips uh, different than Bud Jones because Bud Jones got bought up by Gaming Partners International. So Bud Jones and Paulson are together in one group and this RT Plastics um, made some, a pretty chip. By the way, the, the chips that went under the water are very pretty. From an aesthetic appeal, this is a very pretty chip. And if you want to see one, come over to my table. Um, but their faded chips are absolutely valueless. I mean, they were selling boxes on eBay and to, as, as late as yesterday or the day before, guy from Florida who got into this happened to get boxes from this company of these faded chips. Okay, now I'd like to have one. I don't have the 250 faded. I mean, it's worth, a, as far as I'm concerned, probably worth a buck. But I'd like to have it in my collection. I've seen pictures of it. I do have a $5 Club Royale faded, and I happen to have it next to the 250 real one. So if you want to come by, you can see it. But there is a company that was snake bit twice. <laughs> a really terrible thing. All right, other questions? Geez, see, Sheldon, we didn't raise as much controversy as you would have liked. We still have, yeah.
Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, 61. Thank you. I wasn't probably allowed to do that, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Wait, wait, wait. So we st oh, yeah, let's do that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time to do that, John. And stay within the hour. You should be really proud. Okay. Now. All right. Take your hand out and let's go. Um, the very first book, the year of publication is 1998. Um, down at Howdy's wife's book on the United States playing card, that's 2001. Um, the records of the H.C. Edward company is also 2001. Now, under the states, um, <laughs> I saw this, I saw, it's okay, I saw this yesterday. The California Chips, okay, it's now called California Guide. And it's issued in 2008 and the authors left off their names and everything. <laughs> There's no sheet inside the cover. So I, I went to CT and I said, who wrote this book? He said, well, Armin Fander and Mel Zhang. And I said, and how would you know that? And he looked, holy shit, <laughs> he never noticed. So anyway, there's a, an authorship. Uh, they're getting more credit than they deserve there. Um, if you go down to Montana, now, uh, Steve Goodrich has done a hell of a job. Um, he, the Casino Chips of Montana is all, he's created a Northwest series. And he will, the North, um, the Northwest series, I believe, is Montana is two in the series. Um, Washington State is one in the series. And now he's added Oregon and then parentheses and Idaho, close parentheses, as his third in the series. And then as he, each one, the first time he publishes, it'll be 1-1 one, one, or 2-1 or 3-1. And I just want to tell you that Montana is volume two, number one, and it's 2002. Um, Oregon and Idaho, you have to add. Uh, same type of name, the Casino Chips of Oregon, Perrin, and Idaho, close Perrin, Northwest Series 3, hyphen 1, and that's in 2008. Um, also, uh, way down at the bottom, Washington, he's now up to a third edition, and it's 2006. And um, Puerto Rico, the, the, the second line, which says 1999 Archie Black, he now has 2009. He has a brand new book out. Um, and I want to add, because I think it's a good book, and I'm sorry to say I didn't even know he had done this, and this, he's already in his second edition. Um, add on the first page the states of Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin in one book by Luke Rapley called A Guide to the Casino Chips of Those Five States. It's in a second edition now, and it's 2008. Um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. Thank you, Sheldon.